Hello and welcome to this episode of Call Your Broker, where we help to educate business owners, public officials, organization leaders, and consumers on all things insurance and risk management. This is Matthew Strzok of Treadstone Risk Management, and today's episode focuses on the steps to take immediately following a major property claim. For this episode, we're joined by Matthew Battle from Rapid Recovery Services. Let's get into it. Welcome to this episode of Call Your Broker. This is Matthew Strzok with Treadstone Risk Management. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about emergency property damage mitigation protocols. uh, And we are joined by Matt Battle from Rapid Recovery uh, Services. So how's it going, Matt? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me. Great, great. So uh, really quickly, I kind of want to give everyone a little bit of a background into Rapid Recovery who you are, where you're located. So uh, just give me a couple of minutes on, uh, you know, how the company came about and where you are and what you do. Sure. We uh, established the company in 2006. Uh, I've been with the company since day one. Um, We are a full service uh, property damage mitigation uh, restoration company. We specialize in public entity work uh, and we really take an insurance claim from day one all the way through reconstruction. Uh, our main office is currently in uh, Teterboro, and uh, we're going to have a uh, new location down in um, Belmar, New Jersey, shortly. Oh, wow. And um, we cover the whole entire state in New Jersey. We only work in New Jersey, but we do cover the whole entire state. Okay. And uh, family-owned business, right? Family-owned business, yeah. My father-in-law is actually the owner. He's very involved. Um I, I'm glad you guys have a good relationship, even still having uh, worked together yeah. for a uh, number of years. Very good. Very good. <laughs> we knew from day one it would work. That's yeah. usually how that happens. Great, great. So uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Rapid Recovery's uh, expertise in the field of, um, you know, cleanup after a major property claim, uh, would you say that, um, like, what's really the the value proposition as far as, I know there's a ton of other like big names that are out there in the marketplace, the serve pros of the world and whatnot. Um, what's the real value proposition behind Rapid and kind of how you go about distinguishing yourself from those other shops that might be out there? I think the, one of the main differences is communication. Um, you will always get the top people in this company on their cell phones day to day. Like I said, the owner is extremely involved in, in uh, every aspect of the business. Uh, so really, you could call anybody uh, about a current job that's going on. Um, you'll know the project manager and, and Bob will be involved and uh, you'll get an answer right instantly of usually what your question is. That's good. So it's not uh, call the 800 number and we'll, uh, no, you know, no, whoever no, picks no. up the phone picks we up the phone. We do have one, but we we tell everybody to please call ourselves. Okay. It's 24-7. Fantastic. All right. So uh, today, uh, the reason why we have you on this episode is, and hopefully uh, we'll have some future episodes with you guys as well, but uh, today specifically, we're going to be talking about kind of the the best practices or uh, the main steps that uh, either a, a administrator at a public entity or an owner at a company should take following a large property loss. And we're talking about things like large fires, um, large water infiltration or flooding um, and other kind of, uh, you know, big windstorm events and things like that. Uh, I think the one thing that you stressed to me in our notes before we uh, started recording here was, re, you know, the focus really should be on health and safety, right? Correct. Um, building occupants, workers, anyone who's coming in and out of that location. That's really like a big focus here, right? Yeah, it's kind of in a category of its own. Where um, when a, when a loss or an incident does happen, that should be first and foremost on everybody's mind. Uh, the workers there, the people that come in and out of the building, uh, if it's a school, the children, and then who also you're inviting in to mitigate the damages as well. Actually doing the work, yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, we have about eight points here. Uh, the first one's uh, sometime I think uh, maybe goes – um, maybe without saying, or maybe even might be overlooked here, but in terms of establishing really good communication, uh, you know, immediately following the loss and then moving forward during the recovery process, it's really important to, 
uh, appoint a main contact person on both sides of the on both sides of the process, right? Correct. The insured as well as uh, you know on rapid side or or on the recovery expert yeah. side, right? Yeah, and with today's technology, it's so easy to start an email chain with all the really important people that you need on it. And uh, for an example of a, a school, you could have a business administrator, the DPW or the uh, public works director. Um, there possibly could be people in the town involved. Uh, and then you have the whole insurance side of it. You're going to have an agent or a broker involved. Uh, the joint insurance fund or insurance company is going to be involved. There's going to be usually an independent uh, property adjuster that's involved. Mm-hmm. And like I said, with the technology, day one, you could start that right away, have everybody's phone numbers on there and email and for the long, for a longer stretch job, long time, time period job, it, it just makes it easier to establish this day one. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I think some of the worst claims, uh, that I've, uh, you know, been involved in, in terms of actually getting to the finish line, there's always been issues in terms of the communication, getting everyone on the same page, whether it's getting the right information to the adjuster so that they can update the file and right. sign off on any of the work, uh, or communicating to, you know, the property owner, uh, what should be done or what can be done and kind of those expectations there. So that's a really good first point. Uh, once you have that communication, uh, system set up, uh, and that's even something that you might even be able to do in your de- disaster recovery plan before anything happens. Correct. Uh, but the second point is, really want to do kind of a high level determination of the the risks and the level of safety in the environment that was impacted, right? Just talk a little bit about what some of those considerations would be in terms of understanding, you know, the location and the, the hazards that could be present. Yeah. So a lot of it is going to be from what you're actually visually seeing um, or potentially smelling if, there, if, it's, if it's an odor issue. Um, and it's really just Making sure the site is secure, uh, getting who, whoever needs to be there and only those people there, and then taking it a step further with them if there's any personal protective equipment that they need to be wearing, whether it's masks or respirators. That's a good point. Yeah, the uh, I actually just recently uh, what came what came to um, a lot of conversation in the the public sector risk management world was the idea of carbon monoxide um, detectors, personal ones. Um, and how, you know, following something like this or a major event like a hurricane or something, you can wander into an area that has, you know, pockets of trapped carbon monoxide gas or um, like you're talking about with respirators in terms of, you know, whether there's mold infiltration or even if it's an older building that might have some asbestos material right. that's become, you know, particleized and, and uh, distributed throughout the air and in the area. Um, that's a really good point. Um, the next one is... Uh, comes comes down to the paperwork, right? And a lot of times it, it all comes down to the paperwork. Um, and so the thought process here is you want to document uh, as much as you can here and keep it as organized as possible. Uh, the first thing that you really want to try to establish, and this goes to whether or not it's going to be insurable or not, is what actually caused the loss. Am I right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and it obviously could be a variety of different things, but anything that you feel could potentially have caused this or um, exacerbated the loss. It, it really almost needs to be tagged as evidence is kind of what we call it, mm-hmm. uh, where it's not thrown away, it's not tampered with, and you you need to save certain items for um, really for the insurance company. Okay. And so now uh, kind of, and, and it's not necessarily its own separate point here in uh, what we covered prior, but somewhere in here is also the element of taking those first mitigation steps, right? And so it's not always apparent uh, or it's not always, uh, you can't always put it within, uh, you know, step two or step three, right? Because um, once you're identifying these risks and you understand what caused the loss in the first place, it's going to fit somewhere in that timeline that now you can come in and do some basic mitigation stuff at the front end, right? Correct. So yeah. what would some of those procedures be in terms of the, the very first mitigation that would be done following, you know, a water or a fire loss? Yeah, well, you want to uh, come in, figure out where the damage spread to is, is one of the first things that we'll do. So if it is a water loss, for example, um, and you're on the fourth floor of a, a building, uh, well, obviously water travels down. So you're going to start on that floor, see where it went through. And water's always going to go the 
fastest, least resistant place it could travel. Mm. Um, so you may get to the third floor underneath it and only the ceiling's wet because it ran down a chase in the wall. Okay. Then you get to the second floor and there's more or less water everywhere. Yep. Um, so it can move around, skip places and. I think uh, one of the one of the most eye opening things I ever heard about with uh, well, it's twofold is uh, with fire losses. Typically, the majority of the monetary damage isn't necessarily the fire. It's the water that gets thrown on the fire right in order to put it out. Correct. Um, and then the second one was just in in passing, uh, you know, kind of hearing about some of the claims that happen in high rises and the amount of damage that a little bit of water uh, in a high rise can actually cause because it can seep through th- so many levels of that building. I, I always thought was, uh, you know, pretty eye opening because, you know, so small little pipe burst in someone's kitchenette on the 35th floor could cause millions of dollars in damage. Um, so even if it's really it's fifth floor, you only are thinking that it's going to be the bottom five floors, but it's not. It's um, traveling through HVAC systems and right. going all throughout the building. So, uh, in terms of the actual mechanics of those kind of first kind of mitigating steps, uh, you guys do what you have like blowers or, um, you know, kind of like, uh, devices that are going to re- remove moisture from, uh, the area or help to kind of mitigate the smoke that might be, you know, sitting around and kind of that smell that might infiltrate some of the undamaged parts of the building. Is that right? Yeah, correct. We'll come in with, uh, dehumidifiers, industrial size dehumidifiers, and it's really whatever the loss calls for, but uh, sometimes we'll use uh, air movers, get some air moving around, uh, fires, we'll, we'll bring in uh, air scrubbers. Sometimes it's uh, you even go as far as setting up negative air where you're bringing air from the outside in uh, that's filtered and then Right. To keep it circulating. And yeah, Correct. so things aren't stagnating and kind of like soaking into sheet rock or whatever. Yeah. Correct. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so in that vein, uh, you know, water, smoke, um, you know, a- any of these kind of byproducts of one of these losses can cause some further damage uh, more so than just what's you know immediately apparent. So uh, our, our fourth main point here has to do with uh, an industrial hygienist. So how might a, an industrial hygienist come into come into play in the, you know, recovery or the, you know, the immediate recovery phase here? Yeah, well, a certified industrial hygienist or CIH, uh, it's really a, a, a very important part of the, of the loss. And um, what they'll do is they'll either test building structure and components prior to being removed, if they do contain things like asbestos. Uh, and not only that, they'll provide an overall uh, site safety of the air quality of the building. And really at the end of the loss, they're going to have documentation uh, that the air is clean and it is acceptable levels where employees or people can occupy the space again. Right. Uh, And if you do go down a a long road and it does end up in a court of law, really a certified industrial hygienist is they have the facts. They're the scientists behind it. And really the only ones that could technically say that the, it is safe or not safe. Or- mm-hmm. And there's a there's like a regulatory component here, too. Right. So um, you can kind of get into the realm of OSHA or POSHA mandates in terms of, uh, you know, air quality, safety for workers and, uh, you know, for people who might come on site as well. Right? Correct. Yeah. For, ch- you know, children in schools. And um, yeah, they, they cover a v- very wide net um, with POSHA and so kind of all encompassed under the CIH. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, all right. So if we have some specialists, we have some people coming in, they've they've analyzed the location. Um, we kind of have a idea of what needs to be done, what the hazards are involved and kind of the, the process that we have to proceed with in order to do any further mitigation and then maybe even you know, rip out or the beginnings of, of rehabilitation of the, of the facility. Um, the one point that you guys brought up had to do with, um, you know, trying to be quick and efficient, but also not being too hasty, right? What could kind of come of that process? Yeah, you, you really want to dissect things, um, more or less how they're built. Really focus on, um, you know, focus on kind of the the most important parts of it as opposed to cutting corners or, you know, like quite frankly, uh, a lot of business owners, even in the public sector as well, they're 
they're focused on getting up and running as quickly as possible. Right? Yeah, right. Exactly. So they, 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 you know, they may ask a lot of situations. They'll say, well, can't we just dry, uh, dry drywall instead of cutting it out and removing it? When in fact, once you start cutting it out and removing it, you find out there's insulation behind the wall and that's completely soaked. Mm -hmm. um, so you're drying, you know, not only what you could see, but there's a lot of unforeseen elements where water or smoke could go that uh, you, you may not necessarily see day one. So you're saying we can't just throw a coat of paint on it and be done with it, right? No, no absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely not. Um, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of problems when it comes to uh, that kind of thinking, uh, you know, to, to, to borrow a very uh, overused but still pertinent uh, kind of euphemism, you know, right. haste makes waste sometimes, yeah. right? Um, uh, the worst case scenario is you try and do things too quickly and I would imagine you guys get some work from that, right? You know, a contractor comes in, tries to do too quick or cuts corners and they need to bring someone else in to kind of fix it the, the way it needs to be, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and accidents do happen even when contractors are working in buildings. There's uh, there's definitely a, a percentage of that work that we do as well. Cleaning up others' messes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you also, you know, just to, to expand on that point a little more too, you, you also want to mitigate the damages as efficiently and quickly as possible as well to not have the claim uh, creep into a much larger situation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely not. Uh, you don't want to be too idle, but at the same time, uh, you know, like we were talking about, you definitely don't want to just kind of rush through it and be like, oh, we, you know, uh, doors are back open. We're, we're good to go. Right. Uh, all right. Uh, I love this point because uh, you specifically uh, bring me into the picture here. But uh, the idea of communicating regularly with your broker or anyone else who has an insurable interest uh, in the in the property. Right. So, I mean, this could be if you lease location from a property owner. Um, again, it's that communication chain piece of it. I would say that uh, keeping the adjuster in the loop constantly is a, a positive, even though sometimes it can get a little contentious or adversarial if you feel like the adjuster might be, you know, kind of pinching pennies and whatnot. Uh, but it always helps. Right. Because if you don't inform them about something, maybe they don't sign off on an expense, right? Correct. Yeah. So we try to make everybody aware of the, the full scope of what's happening, even though we're only involved in, say, the, the actual building structure. Um, th there's so many more elements that we see that we just try to communicate with with the owners and 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 the brokers and and the insurance agents as well. There could be a whole element of um, documents or contents that are damaged mm -hmm. that really won't, we won't get involved in replacing those. Um, but it is a huge part of the whole entire scope of loss. Right. Right. Um, okay. That's, that's, that's good to know. That's, uh, I, I, I can appreciate that as, uh, someone who likes to take a very hands-on approach as a, as a broker and risk manager, uh, and getting that feedback is always welcome, you know, cause the, it's, it's always good to have too much information and, you know, as opposed to not enough and, and feel like you're kind of left out of it. Uh, all right. So the, the second to last point here we have um, may or may not apply to commercial entities so much, um, but it really has to do with um, procurement and payment processing. And, uh, you know, there's certain ways that you typically uh, conduct your business and, and procure materials or do your purchasing when everything's hunky dory. But after a loss like this, um, one of your points was to, as best possible, maintain those procedures. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in a, like you said, in a case of a public entity, you're still following all the Department of Labor laws and the prevailing wage laws and having contractors um, uh, that do certified payrolls and have public work certificates. It, it's no different from when you would go out to a sealed bid project. Mm. Uh, the only difference is this is an emergency situation where there are laws where um, you need to get this work done quickly. Um, and that was gonna, that was going to be my next question was, uh, you know, the the hours after something happens, um, you know, do you have to be worried about like the insurance company coming back and saying, oh, you shouldn't have had these guys come in and put in the blowers or, you know, kind of those first steps of that mitigation process? Is there really concern from that standpoint or is really the rule of thumb, you know, protect whatever you can immediately afterward? Yeah, well, you, you definitely there's there's a, many steps you could take before these losses even occur. And 
getting a reputable contractor on board beforehand, before the loss and screening them, like like businesses do with so many other aspects of what they do day to day. Uh, they know who the people they're work- going to be working with. Um, so you kind of vet them beforehand. Um, and from the standpoint of the record keeping throughout the payment and procure- procurement process, right? Um, some adjusters treat things a little bit differently, right? Yeah, they do. Uh, and it's great that there is uh, different uh, different ways of doing things. Um, but the, the adjusters is they're going to work directly with the business administrators or the owners um, with the oversight of the brokers as well. And uh, will they get really granular? Like, will they go down to the down to the screw cost or will they, uh, you know, kind of lump things together in certain pots when it comes down to it? Uh, There's a couple different ways of of billing um, and there's a couple different industry standard uh, systems that you can use. And we like it the best when we use one system and the adjuster is using a completely different system Mm -hmm. because then we're going out about two different ways, but we're coming up with the same scope of work. And hopefully the same price. Mm-hmm. And that's really the best case scenario that, that we find where you have two completely different ways of looking at it. But do you guys use Xactimate or do you use something else? Uh, for, for commercial, we do. Um, for public entity stuff, it, we use it as a platform. Mm-hmm. But the Xactimate program per se doesn't counter in for prevailing wage and paying that type of a high. So you have to put like an adjustment in for that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the um, adjusters that we deal with throughout the state, they're, they're specifically for public entity adjusting. Yeah. I can remember after, uh, after Sandy uh, here in New Jersey, we had a, we had a ton of claims where uh, adjusters from out of state from Tennessee and whatnot would come in and say, Oh yeah, that costs a hundred dollars a square foot in order to replace and we were like, whoa, hold your horses. This is New Jersey. It's like yeah. 225, you know, yeah. like it was completely different. Right. There's a lot of uh, people wanted to move here because they thought they were uh, going to make a lot more money. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, to that end, um, you know, now you, you, you pretty much you've gotten to the point where, you know, the total scope of construction, um, you're probably starting on principal construction and, and uh, rehab of the premises. Uh, just talk a little bit about kind of obtaining construction quotes. Um, you know, you want to be thorough, but at the same time, you know, we're, we get back into that, um, you know, quick versus uh, kind of exact debate and taking your time. Um, so in terms of like obtaining those quotes for reconstruction, would you have kind of any best practices as far as that goes? Yeah. One of the things we like to do is really reconstruct. We say reconstruction kind of happens day one because mm-hmm. um, we're there. We know what we're taking out and, and there's no reason that that process can't start day one. So even it's, it is point number eight in our discussion here, but it, it is one of those things that could kind of overlap into different areas. Um, most of the time, the insurance companies would like two separate um, reports. They want one for the emergency services and then have a definitive line where that stops and then a second one for the reconstruction aspect of the loss. Okay. Um, so, again, it could really start happening day one because in some losses, you kind of know what the scope's going to be, what you're removing, and just doing it all in reverse, putting it back. Okay. I occasionally uh, some disputes arise, right? When we're talking about different kind of uh, adjusting methodologies or different types of systems used to kind of price things out. Has it been your experience that really that open line of communication between the contractor and the insured and the adjuster cuts down on a lot of that? Absolutely. If, if people know the first five days of everything you're doing and what you're removing and why, then there really should be no um, major hang up, you're yeah, saying, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you're, when you're rebuilding, yeah. uh, because everybody knows this is what, this is what was removed. This is what has to go back. Yeah. And you're always bringing back the client to a like kind and quality of what they had. Mm-hmm. So we're not coming in and, you know, uh, somebody had a home ec room that was from 50, 60 yeah, years ago. Obviously we yeah. can't get those older products, they're going to get new products, but it's the same kind and quality of what they had back then till now. Right. So we're not going to come in with stainless steel (laughs) appliances and everything else. Yeah. It's not the the quality of what they had before. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes, you know, sometimes you can't, they made products years ago that um, just aren't 
by law what we can use today. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it's uh, it definitely kind of, you know, when you have updated building codes and things like that, a, a lot of times that can get a little bit hairy. But um, I can tell you the, the clients that I've had that ran into the biggest issues with these things, they, they feel like there's a blank check, right? Um, they, they think, oh, well, you know, I get to just replace everything and, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what it costs or how it's done. Uh, and that's really not the answer. Uh, the answer is that, especially when you have an insurance company involved, you know, they're going to want to know what the money's being used for, whether it makes sense, if there's a rationale. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the, that's one of the best qualities of a good, um, you know, disaster recovery contractor is, um, not just kind of being able to get the work done, but also to provide that backup and provide the rationale as to why certain things need to be done the way that they're done, um, you know, moving forward. And, so. that, and that's where the adjusters really come in as well, because they're going to pay for what you had. Now, if you want to upgrade from that, that that's fine as well. We do mm-hmm. a lot of that where we're sending a separate upgrade or change bill to the client. Right. Um, carpets are a perfect example. A lot of people have older carpet and uh, especially in schools. Now, uh, the newest product is carpet squares. Everybody wants to go to carpet squares. They're a considerable amount more money than mm-hmm. just laying down a broad loom. They're going to pay for the broad loom if you want to kick in some extra money to upgrade it. That's all fine. That you know, mm-hmm. The insurance companies don't mind that yeah. as long as it's not. Yeah, we want the brass fixtures, not the, uh, okay. not the stainless steel <laughs> ones right. that we had. Yeah, You're exactly. Right. So, all right. Well, that's all I had. Um, I, I, I want to say thank you. Like I said, I, hopefully uh, we could do some more of these, you know, yeah, down the line, absolutely. talk about maybe some specific uh, cases or case studies. Uh, if people want to find out more information about Rapid Recovery, where can they find out more online about you guys? Yeah, we have a website, rapidrecoveryservices.net. Um, you can go on there. And like I said, mine and, and the owners, we, all of our cell phones are listed on there. Uh, there's the 866 number, the, the toll free number you can call out as well. And uh, we have an email list. We can put you on that as well. All right. Fantastic. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, that's the end of our episode. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having us on. Thanks. And that's a wrap. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Call Your Broker. We hope you got something out of it. If you did, please, please, please hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment or a review. If you have specific questions, you can always reach out to us directly at either treadstonerisk.com or fbanj.com. We'll see you next time. And as always, this is a reminder to call your broker. Fearful.